1993 was an incredibly interesting year and a time to live, at least when it came to home computing history. The electronic revolution was in the midst of its rapid progression, and it seemed that every day new companies were created, while older ones went under or closed down. New technologies emerged from seemingly torn out of sci-fi movies ideas and invaded our daily lives with new gadgets and toys, while the ones we grew up with were disappearing as if they never even existed in the sea of old and useless tech. It's hard to imagine that by 1993, computers used to put a man on the moon a couple of decades ago seemed like a joke compared to what most folks had at home. The world was clearly divided, perhaps not politically by symbolic and already torn down Berlin Wall, but definitely in terms of electronic entertainment. USA and Japan were nearly entirely dominated by console gaming, while Europe still favored personal computers. In the East and in former Eastern Bloc countries, there was a steady mixture of 8 and 16-bit machines, while in the West, 16-bit generation of systems already had a strong foothold and older systems were slowly being phased out. It was an interesting year for Commodore as well. Although it still manufactured C64s, it was clear that Amiga line of computers were its main machines that they were focusing on. Sadly, that focus was misplaced in unnecessary investments in models that had no future, and the company itself was badly mismanaged, signs of which were painfully obvious by 1993. A year prior, Commodore released three models, A600, 1200 and 4000. And as much as the first one of these was arguably unnecessary product and a mere rebranding of already redundant A500 Plus without the numeric keyboard, the other two were at best iterative upgrades to machines that came before. They offered a new and improved AGA graphic chip, but sadly that chip was your typical too little too late scenario. It couldn't really compete on the market that was aggressively penetrated by growing popularity of IBM PC clones and their powerful VGA graphics. Not to mention the slowly becoming more and more affordable SVGA graphic cards. On top of that, Commodore was gearing up to release its first and, as the time has proven, last attempt at 16-bit console in form of ill-fated Amiga CD32, following their own footsteps of just rebranding earlier products. To simplify, CD32 was an Amiga 1200 without keyboard and with a CD reader stuck on top, in a smaller console appropriate dark grey coloring. By then, the amount of AGA-based games was very limited and it didn't look as if it was going to change dramatically, as most of the shrinking populace of Amiga users were still on basic OCS and ECS machines, and the remaining developers, if they wanted to stay on the platform, would have to target the majority and not minority. So, CD32 as a result, simply put, was a flop, and had even less exclusive titles than A1200. Many of these games were no more than ports from earlier systems, sometimes with added animated intros, digitized speech and CD music only. Not always though, and that was probably the last nail to the coffin of this CD-based failure. That all may sound grim and sad, but to be quite honest, Amiga, despite slowly nearing its life's end, had one of the best, if not the best year, at least when game releases were taken into account. And there were well over 400 of them in 1993. The system was long enough on the market to mature and the developers knew exactly how to squeeze every bit of that sweet sweet gaming juices from this aging but still very ripe machine. Many of the system staple titles were released, some of them considered now as timeless classics. Games like Dune 2, Syndicate or The Settlers, just to name a few. Most importantly though, at least to this video, in 1993 Callisto Entertainment, a French-based developer, released Fury of the Furies on PC, Amiga and Mac. The game was basically nearly identical on all of these, but we'll focus on the Amiga version here. For two reasons. One, being my nostalgic feelings towards the system I grew up with, and other, Amiga being a disc-based machine, and the game introduced a couple of interesting solutions that at least tried to minimize the disc swapping that the system was infamous for. First of all, the intro animation was limited to first disc only, and the game loaded up from the second, meaning that after watching the intro once, a player could just start up the game from the second disc every single following playthrough, skipping the first disc altogether. Secondly, the game offered save states that were also restart points. Automatic ones at that, and they saved at the beginning of each first and sixth level. It may seem like nothing to write home about now, but you have to remember that not only it was early 90s on the Amiga, but most importantly, 
Fury of the Furries, technically speaking was a hybrid of a platformer and a puzzle game. Back then, games mainly used a password lock progression system. Not having to go through all these first levels every single time, but being able to load up from last furthest checkpoint, hugely minimized disk swapping and encouraged continuous attempts at beating the game. The star of Fury of the Furries is 90s bad. The planet of friendly fairies was dethroned by rebellious and evil creature, so-called the Wicked One, who by extension of that act also captured and imprisoned the king of all fairies, and changed all the remaining ones into his mindless and aggressive drones. And it was then, when the ship that has been traveling through space for god knows how long, crash landed on the planet. The four fairies that came out of it, yellow, red, blue and green, were the last remaining, unaffected by the Wicked One. Right then, on the spot, seeing the omnipresent destruction, they decided to save both the king and the planet. Despite the story being dull and quite bland, the intro animation, while being short, is actually pretty decent and worth watching at least once. Fear of the Ferris is a huge game. It's made out of eight basic regions of desert, lagoon, forest, pyramids, mountains, village, castle and the factory, where you'll have to face the final body, the aforementioned The Wicked One. Each of those regions consists of 10 levels ranging in size, from couple of screens to four-way scrolling, multi-screen monstrosities filled with tons of puzzles and secrets. And if that wasn't enough, there are also hidden bonus levels in nearly every single stage. Often more than one per level, sometimes even nested within each other. And finding all of these, even in a multiple playthrough, borders on impossible. Having to know that they are there and that they're filled with gold coins that every 100 of transforms into extra life encourages discovery and multiple attempts at the game. Anyway, you are in control of the titular colorful Furious Fairies. That to be quite frank, in no way other than at the pop culture themed loading screens seem furious in any way. But I suppose that's irrelevant. What is odd though, but still has no real influence on gameplay, only being an interesting talking point, is that in introduction we've been shown initially that there's four of them, red, blue, yellow and green, while during gameplay there's always only one that can morph into all others, if level that you're in allows for it, that is, as not in all stages all furies are available. So in the end, I'm not sure if there's one, all four, or if that was just gameplay design decision or limitation that any explanation of was omitted entirely. This single curiosity aside, each fluffy creature has a different set of skills and abilities based on its color, useful in different levels and puzzle solutions. The yellow one can shoot projectiles and charge that shot for a bigger and stronger hit that can be used both offensively against enemies and as a utility to destroy certain level elements opening up new areas or to solve riddles. The red one can bite, and that he does. Walls, floors or anything else, he's not picky, all to help with level progression or finding secret areas of course. The blue fairy dives into water and shoots bubbles, to either defeat underwater dangers or as you probably already guessed, destroy obstacles and open pathways to hidden levels. Finally, there's the green one, arguably the best one. He has a grappling hook and a line that can be used to swing over dangers and to get to hard to reach places, and also, which is more important in puzzle based levels, to pull certain blocks. Dangers that our heroes face, on their path to save the fairy king, to simplify could be classified into one of three groups, environmental, living and puzzle based. Environmental dangers consist of different types of obstacles, spikes, acid pools, and they kill fluffy creatures instantly on touch. They are, however, in majority of cases not moving, so if taken into account while traversing through levels should not surprise as much as the others may. Living dangers, plain and simple, are creatures of various kinds. This can be moving on pre-assigned paths, be completely static or activated while fairies are in the level or their vicinity. Such activation either results in change of movement or an attack. And last but not least, fairies can also die horribly and unexpectedly in puzzle-based dangers. Those are completely unique and different from one another, often being a direct result of not completing puzzles in right way or order, by falling into a fake puzzle trap or just pure coincidence making a wrong turn where one way leads to death while other progresses through the level. 
fairies on their quest can collect coins, extra lives and extra time buffs. Every 100 coins awards an additional life, which makes them a priority since they're basically everywhere, unlike extra lives which are usually hidden in secret levels or in hard to get or easy to overlook spots. Extra time does exactly what it says on a tin, extends time given to complete a particular level. Simple as that. More complex levels also use teleports and colorful gates. And while the earlier are quite obvious in their use, the latter work based on the color they are. Passing the gate while not having a certain colored creature enables use of that color. And directly opposite to that, if you do have a fairy of same color as the gate, passing through will disable it. It's quite clear then that this is not just a game of nimble fingers, as Fury of the Fairies requires a keen mind as well. It's one of those games that start off easily, introducing players to new mechanics and puzzles with each level, slowly seducing them with its addictive gameplay loop. In fact, it has a very low entry threshold, where first one or even two regions seem easy and more like an extended tutorial, but from third one onward, the difficulty grows considerably with each and every level, and mastering the game is a true testament to player's skill and sharp thinking. If I had to compare Fury of the Fairies to any other game, it would be tough as it's truly a unique title. But there is one that comes to mind, and although it's much easier, shorter and less puzzle-centric, The Lost Vikings could be considered similar. It was released in the same year, so it's hardly an inspiration, but it was managed more smartly and developed from ground up for many more platforms, popular consoles of the early 90s included which gave it a much wider audience and caused it to become sort of a lovable memory of yesteryear to many. And now, so many years later, Fury of the Fairies, while being amazing and one-of-a-kind game that had a potential shot of becoming something bigger, perhaps even a franchise, is still same as it was back then, at the very best, an undiscovered gem. To be quite honest and not leave anything unsaid, it's worth to mention that Namco bought the rights to Fury of the Fairies in 1993, then they released it a little over a year later in heavily butchered state rebranded as Packing Time. It came out on PC, Mac, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo and Game Boy, but was altered to such a degree that nearly everything starting with gameplay through graphics to levels were changed. The end result was a messy mashup that neither looked nor played well and was easily forgettable to say the least. Fury of the Furries is a true classic, even if hardly known and remembered today. It was important part of my youth, so I may be biased, but feels as incredible to play now as it did nearly 30 years ago. The graphics aged nicely and look great, despite being older than many people who may end up watching this video. Sound effects are okay. They work and that's as much as you could expect from a game like that. Music tracks are pretty decent, but not intrusive and they don't distract from gameplay. That also means, however, that I won't find myself subconsciously humming or whistling them after playing. And finally, ever-increasing difficulty with new mechanics around every corner and hidden levels all over are a pleasure to discover and immerse yourself in. All that, put together, leaves me with no choice but to rate Fury of the Furries a solid 9 out of 10. If you liked this video, leave a like, share and subscribe. If you didn't, let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and see you next time.